Hi everyone. So this is now our uh, last topic that we'll talk about in this um, topic two, lecture topic two, where we'll talk about atoms, ions, the history of the atomic theory, and so on. And we're going to close off by discussing a little bit about the periodic table, um, which is a tool that we use quite a bit in chemistry, especially at the general chemistry level, to really understand you know uh, properties of elements and substances. And we'll also talk a little about the naming system or nomenclature of simple inorganic and organic compounds. Before we start with the periodic table, I want to kind of just continue off from the previous topic, which is where I was talking about ionic and covalent molecules, uh, ionic compounds and covalent molecules, just to give some examples of these uh, compounds and molecules. And you'll see them again when we talk about the periodic table, because that's when things will probably start to make sense as far as where these things are coming from. Um, the ionic compounds, remember, are uh, electrically neutral uh, species. They are composed of cations and anions. So if you look at all of these examples, NaCl, for example, um, is an ionic compound because it has one sodium plus ion and one chloride uh, minus, you know, the chloride ion is Cl minus. And then MgF2, magnesium fluoride, is a um, ionic compound because it has one uh, Mg2 plus ion and two F minus ions. This is the, called the magnesium ion. This is called the fluoride ions. Uh, Li2SO4 is an ionic compound because it has two Li plus ion, the lithium ion, and then one sulfate ion, which is the anion here, and that's a polyatomic ion. And here's another example of that, FeNO32, one iron two uh, ion, and then two nitrate ions, which is another polyatomic uh, ion. Each of them has a charge of negative one. Covalent molecules, remember I said uh, in the previous video that this is going to be a combination of non-metal um, elements on, this, uh, on the right side of the periodic table. So things like SO2, which is called sulfur dioxide, NH3, ammonia, H2O, water, P2O5, um, diphosphorus pentoxide. All of these are examples of covalent molecules. If you look at the periodic table, which we'll talk about in a second, they are all located on the right side of the periodic table. So I just want to get started with this, you know, as a way to, to br uh, connect the previous section talking about ionic and covalent uh, compounds with the periodic table, which we're going to start off right now. So if you remember uh, way back at the start of this topic, at lecture topic two, we talked about how we get started with the periodic table in chemistry, how uh, at the very beginning, um, 2,400 years ago, people, uh, you know, were able to extract some metals from the earth and they were able to kind of learn about the properties of those elements and those are colored in green. They, they're what uh, existed at that time and then around 1776, which is around the time of the American Revolution, um, there are more elements discovered, which was uh, here colored in uh, bluish color or cyan color, and you notice that the the bulk of the periodic table are still fairly empty. Okay, so we came to around uh, would say about 1800s or so, about mid 1800s. Since between the uh, mid to late uh, 1700s to the mid 1800s, a lot of discoveries in chemistry were happening. That's kind of like the the golden times of chemistry, and people started to discover a lot more elements. And you can see that almost, uh, you know, the modern periodic table is uh, almost there, you know, we're missing about three of those, uh, three three rows or so um, uh, of um, uh, elements, but, you know, uh, then there's some empty, empty ones here, but at that point, quite a few stuff was discovered already, okay, quite a few elements were discovered already, and a guy, uh, a Russian scientist by the name of Mendeleev, decided that you know, this uh, at that time is just a bunch of these elements and he was thinking that maybe he could organize these elements into a pattern that would make sense uh, in terms of um, uh, the way these uh, uh, elements behave or their chemical and physical properties, okay? So what he decided to do is he decided to look at, um, you know, masses of these elements and he thought that if he was to organize these um, elements in terms of masses, he found that he could actually uh, rank them and notice that there's he, he noticed that there's a periodic pattern. In other words, that 
the the elements that behave the same way or have similar chemical properties if they're organized the same way the pattern tend to repeat again and again after a certain number of elements so this is what he referred to as the periodic law so what I mean is the following uh, at, that, at that time it was known for example that things like sodium and potassium and lithium for example have similar reactivity similar chemical properties so Mendeleev decided to group them together uh, in one group and they, he put them based on their mass uh, one after another in terms of which one is heavier and he was able to notice that when he organized them that way that the other elements if they organize they're organized based on uh, chemical properties tend to have that repetition as well so you tend to see elements going a certain way and then repeating the next element would come that sodium which is a similar property with lithium would repeat after a certain number of elements in this case two elements and then eight and then eight and then eighteen and so on he didn't know why they had to repeat that way but then he just said that uh, at that point that there's a periodic law there's some kind of repetition of behavior um, as a result of organizing the elements based on their similarity in their chemical properties okay so this is then uh, referred to as the periodic table now let's talk a little bit about Mendeleev uh, himself he noticed obviously that there's a couple of things that are still blank here when he organized the periodic table this way okay when he organized the elements in this periodic pattern he noticed that there's certain elements that are still blank so then what he did was he predicted what these elements should be okay so imagine that at that time these elements were not known right nobody knew that there's supposed to be something here but he said that based on you know the way I organize these elements there has to be something here both of these things that fill up these empty uh, blocks right here there has to be elements here so he predicted the existence of these elements before they were discovered and uh, some of these elements that he predicted that should exist were things that he called eka boron eka aluminum eka silicon eka zirconium and so on and he gave them masses based on his prediction um, the word eka just means um, uh, after so things like eka aluminum just means an element that has to come after aluminum eka silicon just means that uh, the element has to follow silicon and so on okay now if he only said that that the elements have to exist that's already come you know somewhat uh, amazing right but then not only that he was able to make specific predictions so this is just an example of one of his prediction which is for the element eka silicon before it was discovered he said that the atomic weight should be 72 the density has to be 5.5 uh, melting point has to be high color has to be dark gray and so on so he made all of these um, uh, predictions before this eka silicon element was discovered and of course later on um, you know people were doing the experiment and they discovered that there's a, an element that uh, fit very much the uh, description of eka silicon now the element itself was discovered uh, in German so it's called germanium but it turns out that the element germanium is basically the element eka silicon that was predicted by Mendeleev before it was discovered and you notice how close these numbers are uh, to the prediction that uh, Mendeleev made. In fact, there's an anecdote about Mendeleev that one of the, you know, one of the scientists working on germanium went to him uh, and uh, said to him that, "Oh, you must be wrong with this uh, eka silicon prediction because I found the density to be, you know, I think only 4.7 instead of 5.5." And what he said to that scientist was that, "No, you, you know, you must be wrong. You have to go back and." retest your experiment and true enough when that uh, scientist went back and tested his experiment he found that the density was actually quite a bit higher than what he originally um, uh, what he originally uh, told Mendeleev so this is the conviction of Mendeleev in terms of his uh, uh, you know theory he really believed that he was you know onto something and he was uh, uh, you know, uh, strong enough to to make a prediction and then uh, want you know want to challenge the experimentalists. Okay, I want to make sure again that here's a good time to kind of go back to that idea of theory and experiment and the difference between hypothesis and in scientific sense and the you know type of prediction we generally make when we talk about it every day.
So here's a, a, a you know Chinese zodiac. Okay, so you can open any kind of magazine. Uh, a lot of times at the back section or even newspapers, there's these prediction about you know this you can use either uh, Western zo you know Western astrology or you can use Chinese zodiac in this case. But they make some predictions about how things are gonna turn out for you for that day, or for that week, or for that year, or for that month. These predictions are not specific. Okay, they don't really. They're very general. It says people born in this year are dependable and calm okay that's a very general prediction okay so some of the people might be dependable and calm some people not okay so these type of predictions are really not testable and they have no value whatsoever but something like what Mendeleev said is something you can test you can go and see is the density of a silicon 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter or not and that's the uh, difference between a scientific prediction versus something like uh, a prediction that is not based on science okay so I want to mention here the uh, periodic pattern that uh, uh, you know is observed uh, uh, in the periodic table so earlier Men uh, Mendeleev uh, grouped these elements in the periodic table based on similarities in properties and what you notice is that this patterns exist for many many different properties both chemical and physical so for example melting point if you look at melting point which is a physical property and if you plot that this is a melting point of the elements plotted against the element type here uh, at on the x-axis you notice that for helium hydrogen helium is here and then you notice that for li from lithium all the way to uh, fluorine you have some kind of a pattern coming down right up and down and then that pattern is repeated again on the third uh, row of the periodic table when you go from sodium down to argon okay so that's what I meant earlier by this repeating pattern so you have this pattern right here like a triangle pattern for example that triangle pattern is repeated again and it's going to be repeated again and again as you go to uh, more and more elements and that's what Mendeleev discovered was he discovered this pattern which he called the periodic law